Hello, everybody. Welcome to Basic Black. Some of you are joining us on our broadcast. Others joining us on our digital platforms. I'm Chris Collins. Your host, Kelly Crossley, is off tonight. Kids tech in STEM, careers in STEM, the field have continued to grow exponentially since 1990, but black and brown people continue to be underrepresented in the field. There are many programs to attract kids of color to STEM, exposing them to everything from robotics to AI, with the hope of energizing youth, destigmatizing science and technology, and decreasing barriers to entry. What are the best ways to encourage and prepare kids of color to pursue careers in STEM and increase diversity in the field. Joining us tonight remotely, Dr. Renee Richardson Goslin, a senior lecturer and researcher, scientist at MIT. Shalala Morissette, president of the Greater Boston Chapter of the American Association of Blacks in Energy. Dr. Natrice Gaskins, assistant director of the Leslie Steam Learning Lab at Leslie University. And Olu Ibrahim, founder and CEO of Kids in Tech, Ladies, we welcome you all to the show. Basic Black has a, a, a right, an opportunity here to find out what is going on with those of color in the STEM field. Let's talk and start with you, Dr. Goslin. Tell me about some of the work you have done when the old way of racism, right, when you could sit across from a, a banker and he would say, well, you know what, you're not gonna get the loan. But now with algorithms, we may not even get that opportunity to try to fight our case. So some of the research I found you to be doing simply fascinating. Could you elaborate? Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm always interested in understanding the human portion of the human AI relationship. And as you suggested, we are relying more heavily on algorithms, outsourcing a lot of our cognitive load, if you will, to make decisions around who gets funding, who gets loans, who gets insured, who gets admitted to schools, who gets hired. And this is happening in all facets of our, our lives. And yet we see that the people who are responsible for programming these aren't reflective of the people who will be affected. And moreover, when there are problems, and for instance, with regard to bias in AI, which is something that is unfortunately impossible to completely avoid, uh, it's the most vulnerable groups who tend to be affected. So my research looks at who trusts AI and why, and. Um, under what circumstances people feel a sense of accountability and responsibility, and how we can use things like friction in our systems to interrupt the sort of automaticity of the use of algorithms and get people to think, well, hang on, should an algorithm even be doing this? And what potential biases could be a part of this? So if we're talking about biases, we're talking about trying to find a way, again, it seems like we're always having this conversation to get to the table. Shalila, how do we get to the table so that we have an opportunity to, I guess, plead our case so that we're not you know, discriminated against as we try to enter into this field? Sure, I, I definitely think that we have to start younger, right? And so you have to be groomed from a very young age. My daughter is four. She's understanding kinetic energy and potential energy. And so that will remove what we think in our heads about math and science being difficult. And so if you're grooming them through high school and middle school and all the way through, they step into the workplace after college or without college, even into the trades um, with a much better sense of confidence. They have a baseline knowledge of, of the world around them. And so I think that's how we remove it. We start really young. So again, it comes down to opportunity and if we look at the public schools, I know there's been some collaboration of trying to implement STEM into the public schools. You know, for one, speaking of a parent of two, you know, my kids have been introduced to STEM, you know, through the private education, probably in pre-K. But those of us of color generally don't seem to really be getting the, the proper entree, the proper, you know, um, opportunity as far as just learning, just recognizing, just seeing that there is some type of opportunity. You mentioned starting young. How young is too young, Natrice? Um, well, I, I, part of the issue is um, 
studies show that uh, students, even girls and boys and um, across um, different groups will be into STEM um, subjects. And then at around age 12, or 13, things start to happen. So by the time they get out of middle school, they uh, are not as engaged or participa uh, participating in um, actively in STEM areas um, as much as they were when they were younger. Um, so even if they do begin early, some messages they're given at some point in, you know, by the time they become 12 or 13, tend to track them elsewhere. And so the statistics actually show the numbers um, you know, math scores for fourth and eighth graders have been dropping since 2015 um, across the board, and especially so when it comes to mathematics scores for white students in grades uh, four and eight are higher than their Black and Hispanic peers. Um, and, and then the other issue is um, representation in STEM fields. So and in the National Science Foundation and some other agencies looked at engineering, where Black people are 3.9% in engineering and um, for Hispanic and Latino people, they're at 10% and then representation is higher in science and even more so in education, humanities and the arts. So if kids aren't seeing uh, enough representation of themselves in STEM fields, they don't see that as an opportunity that is viable for them. Makes perfect sense. And you know, I kind of look at you know, kind of how I came up. My dad was an engineer and my brother's an engineer. My dad obviously was an engineer. My sister's a physician. Um, so there obviously was STEM role models in the house, but everybody doesn't have that. Everybody's not that fortunate. Mm -hmm. Olu, I know your path kind of led you in that direction as you had great role models in that field. Yes, um, so my dad is a, has a PhD in biophysics. My mom's a nurse and they're researchers. Um, I grew up as a low-income kid, but um, as we were growing up, um, my dad had the foresight to buy our first family computer and built it with us. And we would play on the computer. And um, as they were getting their degrees in the sciences, our traje economic trajectory changed. We moved to, to our first family home. So I saw the power of education. I saw the power of STEM as a real economic way to get out of poverty. So that led me to start Kids in Tech um, with the memory of me and my dad, but also as Matrice said, Mentors are really important. Our flagship program, our after school tech club, we get um, STEM professionals as well as qualified teachers because we know instruction really matters, but we get two types of teachers for our kids to co-lead our programs. And they're working on different types of projects. So anything from typing and coding to web design. As Nutri said, that the ages between age eight and 14 are really crucial because kids get really excited and they lose interest. And our hope is with our tech club, they see representation um, with the people with the people who co-lead. Uh, they go on field trips and interact with executives. So it makes it real, like a real pathway. And they're connecting and building relationships so that they too can do it. So that is the goal. We're trying to um, eliminate those barriers and you know, STEM is not these esoteric concepts. It's for everyone, it's everywhere. And we want kids to feel confident and really increase their STEM skills so they can persist um, and take more uh, science and math classes as they, as they reach high school. So how do we get Olu staying with you? How do we get kids of color enthused about math and science and things that may not traditionally be, you know, as, as, as sexy as video games? Or maybe video games is part of the, you know, the solution. You tell me. Yeah, it is actually. Um, video games has a lot of art, engineering. It has all the STEM concepts built into how you build a video game. And I think it's really just breaking it down for kids and letting them know, like, for you to build this video game, you need all of these different types of people uh, to build this product. And to even imagine the product, you need somebody who's artistic and creative to even sketch it. Um, and then from there, we need coders to code to code the game. And, um, you know, we need marketers to market the game so you can buy it and play with it. So, you know, again, STEM concepts are everywhere. It's just really telling kids, breaking it down and saying, here are some things that here, that here's what you can do, for instance, in the gaming industry. And here's why it really matters. And, um, and those, like I said, those skills are everywhere. And I think um, that's how we have to do it. We have to make it very real, very tangible, really break it down to kids and also get folks from the industry to interact with students as well. I'm a bit journey. troubled by, you know, not just that we're not consistently entering the field, 
but once we get into the field, the retention doesn't look to be that good. I mean, the retention seems to be a, a little bit subpar and certainly behind um, those, those of, of white students entering the field. Natrice, how do we, once we get them, hold on to them and keep them on that track? Um, mentoring is important. And my sister, uh, she is an engineer and chemical engineer. She went to MIT, she went to Columbia, but she's no longer in engineering. Um, she was met with a lot of racism in her different, and she worked for all the major pharmaceuticals. Um, and I think, you know, not talking to her right now, but um, I think if she had had a support system or support network of mentors to help her manage a lot of that was happening, I think would have kept her in the field, at least for, um, for the duration of her career. Um, and so, you know, I think you know, other students see that and they may um, opt out, even if they're interested in the particular areas. I've had um, college students who finished their degrees in the sciences who will email me and say that they don't want to go into those fields anymore after seeing what professionally what's happening. Um, so they're still excited about bioengineering or whatever their major was in the area that they chose, but they need to have ways to bring themselves. It's kind of like self-efficacy and self-concept follows students um, into the professions and helps them to be able to really see a purpose for their work, even if there are a, if there is adversity. And so um, I looked at myself as an example. My mother was a computer programmer an analyst, and I hated computers until high school, until an art teacher brought me into that world. And today, you know, I'm doing AI art and having shows at the Smithsonian and all that other stuff. But it started with a teacher who saw my interest and was able to push, but also knew that I had a, a support network of people to be able to keep me going. Um, so when things did get rough, I had something to fall back on. Is that support system, is it, is it large enough? Is it big enough? Is it supportive enough? You know, I, I, I go back to the great mm -hmm. civil rights leader, Whitney Young. It's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have an opportunity than to have an opportunity and not be prepared, which begs mm -hmm. the question, do we have the opportunity? And if we have the opportunity, are we prepared, Shalala? That support system needs to be bigger. And so, Olu, I have to say thank you for the work that you're doing, Therese, all of you amazing women. Um, I'm getting these kids in high school. I stepped away from my day job at National Grid uh, on loan to teach engineering to 11th and 12th graders at Dearborn STEM Academy. And so I am seeing um, those opportunities that we're missing out on because we are not prepared. And so I'm trying to change that narrative. A lot of what we do is bringing folks in to show representation, but we're bringing pizza to class. What I need in the classroom is folks that are coming in and saying, what are you guys working on? How do we help you? That's opportunity to develop relationships, long lasting relationships. If someone who's in industry is working with a young kid and sees their promise and they're able to say, you know what, when you graduate, come see me, right? I might have an internship with you or let's do that internship now while you're in class, right? Let's expand on what you're doing in engineering and, and close the gap, right? That's what we need. And so providing more chances in industries that they didn't even know about, right? There's an asphalt camp with the Department of Transportation. That's what our kids should be going out and seeing. They should be looking at, you know, the large companies, National Grid, Eversource, all of these guys, and seeing what do you do as a technician out in the field? When you're doing a leak investigation, what happens? We've got offshore wind that we should be looking at. There's tons of opportunities there. But if you don't have teachers that have those connections and don't have the support to offer that to our young people, it will be very difficult. And there seems to be a gap, not just with those of color, but also gender, a, a huge disparity in terms of females, women entering the field. How do we fire up? The, the, the female population and not just fire them up, but, but really create an avenue, a path that says, you know, this is an inclusive environment, that this is a, a viable field that you should be certainly exploring, Olu. Yeah, so um, I think just to add on to Shalaya's point, um, in terms of adding more women to the table, I'm, pro I'm the proponent of women need to start creating their own tables and bringing their own chairs. Um, I think the more women of color who do that, um, the more of a network we can build. Um, I also think, especially with young girls in our program that we work with, we 
we always try to always like connect them with another female role model so they can see that it is possible. But as they move through the trajectory, as Latrice said, there are systematic barriers that prevent people from falling off. So I think there's something to be said about the workplace and how do we create inclusive policies to support women in their, in their career journey. So I think it's really um, on business leaders to think about how do we support women in the workplace? What kind of supports do they need so that their geniuses don't get left on the table. We need them all to shine. So what can we do at our own nonprofit, our own businesses around STEM to make sure that they stay? Um, a lot of women leave STEM for various reasons, you know, um, not lack of mentorship, which we know is very important throughout um, a STEM career. Um, lack of, you know, just support. How do I, how do I get to the next level? They don't know how to get there. Um, policies around maternity leave if a woman wants to leave. It just there's, there's just a whole bunch of workplace policies I think could be more family and women friendly so that they stay and that they continue to contribute because um, there's so much geniuses behind all these women and young girls and we need the systematic supports to help them um, achieve those uh, goals as well and bring their ideas to the table. Renee, my perception, whether it be right or wrong, that over at MIT would be heavily uh, male populated. Um, and, and obviously we know, you know, the history and what happens over at MIT arguably the best, you know, place in, in the world concerning regarding technology. How do you start to level the playing field and get more females into the field, I guess would be my question. And are you seeing more females actively entering MIT and into the technology space? Yeah, I think it's a two-pronged approach. I think there are individual level solutions, but the ability to find a mentor can often be idiosyncratic. If you're lucky enough that someone's in the organization that would take a liking to you. Um, and we do know that the people of color who do get in those positions are often doing sort of this unpaid work that ends up uh, making it difficult for them to succeed in the organization because the organization doesn't value or reward those things. So I think that really we need structural solutions. Individual level solutions are definitely important. Getting people to sort of get excited, um, limiting intimidation. Uh, myself, you know, I never would go to office hours because I thought that was for kids who were not doing well in school. When I got to college, I realized office hours is where it happens. That's where, you know, you become more than just another face in the class. But I think we need to emphasize structural solutions because this issue is a reflection of systemic barriers. So we need systemic change to solve it. That includes resource allocation. You know, we need to hold our elected officials responsible and accountable. Where are these resources going? Why are they not going to our school? We need to bust the mythology around pipeline. That's a lazy thinking. Oh, well, there's just not enough pipeline. Why is it that Black people, though, when we are looking to hire, we have no problem finding Black people who are talented and in STEM, right? We know that the majority of white people have very, to put a nerdy word on it, homophilous social networks. That basically means people get attracted to people who are like them. If we have an imbalanced organization, that just means that that, that inequality is going to get reproduced. We need to change our hiring practices. I'm very proud to be at MIT. But you know what? There's a lot of talent that doesn't have that degree, that stamp on it, right? And so we need to go beyond those traditional channels because those traditional channels have been most open to people who've benefited from a legacy of you know, early exposure because they've been fortunate enough to have family members. Not everyone has that. Um, but I also think we need to provide low risk opportunities for people to tinker around. You know, Bill Gates created his company in his garage. Um, this notion that we have to have all our ducks in a row before we step into STEM, we need to change that. Because one thing that Black and Latino kids don't often get is room to fail, room to make mistakes. But you know, science is about that. It's about discovery. It's about putting these things together. Did it work? Did it not? Let's tinker. And so when we use language, when we have um, discussions, when we have structures that are exclusive and intimidating, that you know, deprives people of color from having the opportunity to have those low risk 
experiences. Sure. And we know that familiarity leads to liking. Sure. So let's get familiar. So I, I feel like we're having the same conversation. I know today specifically it's about STEM, but I feel like it's the same conversation we have in many fields, many fields that are, are, are lucrative. I, I spend most of my time in the finance world and we could really have the exact same conversation. You know, the lack of role models, the lack of mentors, the lack of people of color that you're looking at kind of distracts or detracts from what you're trying to do and, and just not feeling um, that, that, you, that you're, you're part of the party, you know, is it, it, all, always difficult. But when we go to the college campuses and, or we go to the high schools or even below, are we actively, are we, are we developing, and I'll, I'll, I'll put this to you, Natrice, are we, are we developing creative thinkers? I know we're talking about STEM, but are, are, are the kids actually grasping it, and are we actually creating those who kind of create and think as opposed to just kind of use? Sure. Um, you know, we taught it, we did a, we offered a course in dual, dual enrollment course in art, AI, and robotics to Somerville High School students like, over the summer. Um, Leslie Steen. And um, we had 16 students and very diverse group um, selected by their teachers. And we wanted to show that um, in a very short time, students could, if they're not in a robotics club, and a third of them probably were in a robotics club, but there were a large uh, number of students who probably hadn't been in that fab lab space at the school. They hadn't um, used, um, you know, done the kinds of things you would do to put together a robot. And so um, at the end of the uh, four weeks, they had a capstone project where they actually had robots and they could show the principal, they could show the teachers and their family members, but, and all those robots made art. Um, so all the robots used AI to make art. And um, one of the things that I push for is making and changing the way the environment is uh, shaped. So um, there are certain um, practices and methods and strategies um, I use that are called techno vernacular creativity and innovation. Um, and that's the book that I wrote. But in there, I talk about the cipher from hip hop and how you can apply that in a maker space. And so by the end of the four weeks, the students are cipher, the, the cipher forms um, at least once or twice a day um, where quiet students start to speak louder and speak more and they know their voices are valued. Um, their contributions are valuable. So at the end, they everyone feels like they're on the same level. Um, and that they're part of something as opposed to just me, us talking at them. Um, so there are things that can happen in the actual space, giving carving time in the hour so they actually have time to tinker. Um, so, you know, 20 minutes of the time, 10 minutes at a time. Um, in some schools, it's uh, packed into the lunchtime. At the end of lunch, you run over, tinker a while, and then go to their classes. But that's an important part of the process. If you don't have time to do that, you don't have time to tap into the kinds of skills that some kids have coming out of private schools and places where they go to maker spaces they have when they go to college and they're ready to get into engineering or other fields. What I thought was amazing, as you mentioned hip hop, was you know, through some of my research that the legendary rapper DJ Grandmaster Flash, a scientist, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Who knew? Right, right? I, mean, I mean, who knew? And that's something certainly that's not promoted, but that was the deal. But why don't we talk about Grandmaster Flash when we talk about engineers? He put to, he adapted the crossfader, right? And that machine is in used all over the world today. So why don't we talk? When we talk about engineering, we can talk about him because he actually does apply engineering and scientific methods to what he does. Olu, breaking the string, and you like myself, you know, had a, an engineer in the house, so it was kind of easy, you know, to kind of see how people in the household follow that path. But how do we break the string? How do we get that 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 you know that those parents who are, are all you know technology uh, savvy and really are passing it on to their kids because until you get you know that type of cycle it's really hard to really make significant change long standing change without those you know those those significant role models and I, and I think it starts at home. Yes, absolutely. You know, I think a lot of um, a lot of our I can talk about our parents in our programs. A lot of them know that it's important. They just don't. They never had. They never had exposure. So for what we do, we always invite all of the parents to come see what the kids are working on at any time, so they can learn the concepts of the kids that they would like. Um, however, 
Um, I think, you know, something that we're definitely working on is trying to get more parent engagement in our program so that they also can teach their kids outside of our programs concepts that we're learning in class. So that's something that we're coming up with because we know the parent involvement is, is key. But again, a lot of our parents are low-income parents. They have worked two or three jobs, but, you know, they're putting their kids in, the, in our program because they understand that, okay, this is an economic pathway for my child to succeed, but this is also a space for them to learn, be creative, and fail miserably and not be punished for it. So I think as so that they gain the some confidence skills. So um, in the coming weeks and months, we, un we understand that that's really important. So that's what we're working on to just kind of get parents to start thinking of like, how do I, I can read my, my child a book at night, you know, if I, you know, these are some kits that I can build with my child at home that we bring, that we give to the parents to work on with their child to kind of get them acclimated to it. So, but we, you know, Parent, parent involvement is obviously very crucial and um, we try to support parents as much as possible. But we also don't want to punish parents either um, as well. Um, but we do just want them to be excited there for their kids in our programs. And through those experiences, I think they'll learn to gain confidence as well to kind of push. Ladies, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm so impressed by the work that all of you are doing and really just keep on keeping on and, and, and get those black and brown kids into technology because as we know, it's everywhere. This is the end of our broadcast and the end of our show. Thanks to all of our guests and thank you to you for joining us. Stay with us as we continue our conversation online and on our digital platforms, Facebook and YouTube. <laughs>
Uh, there, was, there was a lot of talk, a lot of corporate involvement as far as getting those of color involved and, and trying to up those and boost those numbers. Natrice, are, are, are we seeing enough, I guess, funding and support corporately going towards those of color, trying to get them directed to tech? Um, I would say no. Um, I also would say it's a difficult, um, you know, when I was in high school doing computer graphics, I thought by the time I'm in my 20s and 30s, this will be everywhere. And, you know, and people have uh, more opportunities than I, and even I had. And that didn't happen. And I was shocked by the time I was in my 30s when, and people are still struggling just to get internet in the classroom. Um, you know, today, you know, we have artificial intelligence, we have emerging technologies that are carving the way the workforce will be in the next three to five years. Um, I was teaching AP computer science um, principals at Boston Arts Academy, noticing that the art students there were just running from the laser cutter to coding back and forth to make things, realizing they don't want to go into computer science, but that in for them for computer science was what they were doing and it was part of their practice. It became embedded in what they do. Um, and then I realized, you know, if we could support that, we begin to support um, people where they're at doing, using coding, using um, AI and other things, we may start to see um, a lot more innovative um, uh, innovations happening in the tech fields that are more diverse. Um, for example, um, I collaborate with AI to make art um, and just recently, people with money actually have started to reach out to me to either do keynotes or to present or even commission me to do work. Um, so Miss Magazine is commissioning me, commissioning me to do a Harriet Tubman portrait using AI. Um, and so it's happening now, but I'm not a kid. Right. I have been doing computer graphics since high school. And for many decades, nobody cared. There was no support, there was no funding, and only recently has this begun to change. And I think um, hopefully through the work that I do and some others that I know are doing, that this opens the door for those who are coming in, many young people, and they see what they've done, and then the funding and support and structures that they need for support um, will be there for them when they're ready to enter the field as well. Artificial intelligence, fascinating, uh, fascinating topic. And I was reading something where where even the color of your skin could affect the way if you're dealing with a, uh, an, an AI faucet that it might not go on? I mean, I, I always have trouble with those things. I, explain that to me. Is that fact or fiction? Uh, I can, that's, I, it's not fiction. Um, you know, research at MIT, you may have heard of Joy B, who, uh, if you've watched the documentary Coded Bias, it's not fiction that facial recognition technologies um, that were trained on data sets that didn't have representative people of color uh, often make mistakes. And the implications are actually devastating when, for instance, uh, facial recognition AI mistakenly identifies someone as being a criminal and they're not. And this has happened, right? Um, right. So I, I think, it, you know, it is not fiction, it is, it is fact. Um, and I think that is why it's even more imperative, right? That we address this issue and solve this problem because as long as we're only consumers and not producers of these technologies, then our points of view will be at the mercy of who's holding the mouse, if you will, who's in charge. And that oftentimes leads to further inequity. So we, we have to, um, I think, really have agency uh, because it, it's, changing the world and, and the gap is only widening. We know that after COVID, not that COVID is done, but during COVID, the digital divide, the so-called digital divide widened, right? Sure. So really this is, this is an essential issue. Yeah, really tragic. You know, the, the digital divide, I mean, obviously it wasn't, wasn't a close race to start with, but now it's just, you know, it's even worse. And are you seeing at MIT, are you seeing an influx of those of color taking the, the, the technology path, Renee, I'm curious. My cousin was a, is an architect um, and he was an MIT grad. And again, when, when he was there or when my dad was working as an engineer, I mean, they were kind of like unicorns. Is that still the case? 
Well, there are not a lot uh, in terms of numbers. That is still true. But there are programs and systems meant to redress some of these issues, right? So um, I think that there are programs, MLK scholars, where we bring you know, researchers in. There's a uh, K to 12 program at MIT for younger children um, that, that's meant to sort of expose them. Um, and I think those of us who are there where people of color try to bang the drum as much as possible. But I think that the other panelists have been spot on in saying that, you know, the sort of drop off that cliff happens long before. And I think that, you know, it's it's essential then that we change the vocabulary. I like how, you know, Shalea sort of suggested that there's a, a branding problem that, you know, what is this? What is engineering? What is computer science? Well, if you have a cell phone, then you've got AI in your hand because what you're seeing in your Twitter feed or TikTok feed there's an algorithm that's determining that, right? So making things real, tangible, practical will be, I think, important to get people to say, this is not something that's, you know, theoretical, that's pointy headed. This is my life. And this is something that can affect me. And to add to Renee's point, um, sure. at Kids in Tech, we are part of um, Mass STEM Week, which starts October 18th. And we are focusing on AI and machine learning activities for kids ages 8 to 14. So one of the topics that we're going to be working on is spatial recognition. Why does it fail, right? So the kids are going to learn about data sets and everything that Renee's talking about. We have to teach kids earlier and get them wrapping their heads around these ethical issues. Why do these ethical issues um, exist in technology? What is causing them? So that they can start to be uh, better problem solvers around this issue. So that's one of the things that um, Kids in Tech is absolutely doing about AI because AI is already everywhere. It's gonna continue to be everywhere. Um, and we have to make sure our kids have a really great understanding of the literacy, how to talk, the language of AI and how to, use AI to solve problems, but in a, I guess you could say in a better way, right? And try to alleviate a lot of the problems that we're seeing with a lot of tech companies because they have not grapples with these ethical issues and how they use AI in their products. So I think that one of the ways to really make this is really talking to our young people, making sure they understand it and playing and discovering with these technologies so that there's better solutions. And we don't have these problems where, um, these algorithms cannot 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 distinguish who's who. Sure. So um, yeah, just so you know, sure. Snoop Dogg's album's named Algorithm. The new album is titled Algorithm. Uh, um, nice. So here's an opportunity to <laughs> nice. introduce it in the classroom. So nice. it seems it seems to me the, the the packaging, the branding is 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 paramount. You know, to to kind of to package it better. It's just to, I guess to sell it better. Um, and, and I think if we can sell it better, then we'll probably get more enthusiasm towards it. Is that, am I correct in saying that, Shalila? Yes, absolutely. Packaging is everything. We were all 16 once, right? And so these kids don't really care about anybody else but themselves. Let's, let's be real, right? When you were 16, you had your own little life, separate and aside from your parents and what was going on in the world. And so it's, it's one of those things where if you can package it right, if it's better than soccer, if it's better than football or playing basketball or making TikTok videos when you have 30 seconds, right? Um, that's how you get them. If I, if I can teach you what TikTok actually is behind the scenes, I've got you. I've got you sold. When I can say to you, think freely, you know, it's, it's taking away the systematic oppression that I've seen within school systems of an 18-year-old should not be asking me to go to the bathroom. I want you to think freely. When I give you an assignment and I say research, dig deep, figure it out. I need that engineering mind to come out of high school strong, right? That is gonna take you so much further. An employer wants people that can think for themselves, that can solve problems. And so if I can get relevant material in front of them and have them solving problems, that's my win. Problem solvers for the future. And those mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of black and brown, culture that, that, that look like us and they're actually getting in, you know, in the mix in terms of tech. I think that's, I think it's fascinating. I think it's obviously overdue, unbelievably needed because without it, I mean, we're, we're already behind and we're just falling further and further behind if we don't get in the race. And certainly we, we need seats at the table. So I applaud the work that all, all four of you ladies are doing. I mean, really fascinating, important work that you're doing and I appreciate the passion 
uh, that you're doing it with. So again, this is basic black. Black and brown people in the tech field, please. <laughs> let's spread the word. Let's get it out there. Let's, let's infiltrate it and, and get us to the, to the table and, and get us to where we need to be so that we are cultivating generations and generations of generations of engineers like Art Collins, my dad. All right, that's gonna do it for Basic Black. You have yourself a great night. We'll see you back here real soon. Thank you.